So what if you do want shading? Well, Nuke actually does come with some shaders, some simple shaders that the scanline renderer knows about. So let's, let's drop one of those down. This is the 3D menu here in Nuke, the cube, the solid cube. And it's got a, a host of shaders. The, this one here, the basic material is essentially like the closest thing that it has to an Uber material. It has specular diffu and diffuse shading and, and uh, constant shading. So if you are in doubt, this is a good material to apply, just the basic material. So I'm dropping down a basic material. And to use it, you connect it to the image input of the geometry you want, want to apply it to. So I'm not going to use this texture for now. We're just going to apply this basic material. Now you see, we're not getting any render. And that is because we have no lights in our scene at all. We need to now upgrade our simple setup here. And I'm going to create a scene node so that I can connect in some geometry, but that I can also connect in a light. So I'm also going to have to drop down a light. Nuke only has one node for lights, but that one node can create different types of lights. So if you look here in the light type, you can create points, which is the default, directional, and spot. I'm going to create a spotlight. I'm going to turn this into a spotlight. And now chances are the spotlight's not shining at our skeleton, so we can't see anything. So I'm going to go back into the 3D view by hitting tab here in the viewport. And I'm going to look through that light. Or let's say I'm going to look through the default view just to figure out where the heck my light is. Because I don't actually know where it is right now. I'm going to frame up my skeleton just so I can see it. There's the light sitting at the origin still. And I can kind of move that light into some position here. Let's move them over to screen right, to the left of our skeleton. And I'm going to turn this into spotlight. It's already been turned into a spotlight. You can see there's the cone of the spotlight. It's not pointing at the skeleton. So I'm going to hold down control and rotate the light so that it's at least pointing at my skeleton. There we go. Now, now the skeleton has a light pointing at him. So let's go look through the camera again. And there's our skeleton viewed through the camera. I'm going to scoot the camera back just a little bit here so that we can see the skeleton a little bit better. There we go. Now let's look through the scanline render. I'm going to hit one, connect it to the scanline render, and I'm going to hit tab while hovering over the viewer. There we go. So we have a skeleton and uh, I don't like that framing. Let's, let's uh, tighten that up a little bit more here. I will scoot that in just a little bit more. There we go. And uh, as of recent versions, Nukes gained the ability to generate shadows in its lights. So if you go to the shadow tab here, you can see right now the light is kind of shining through his eye socket and he's not ca the light's not casting any shadow. If you wanted to, you could turn on shadows for that light. And now Nuke will generate shadows. It's Nuke's 3D system. And I just want to make a caveat now that we're looking at some slightly more advanced features of Nuke's 3D system. In my opinion, it's fairly weak in its shading and uh, shadow ability. These shadows are basic shadow map type shadows and the quality of them is not very high and they're not very fast to render. So I would say use this for situations when you, when you need a little bit of 3D stuff, not a lot of 3D stuff, and you don't mind the render time affecting your performance in Nuke. But overall, this is uh, these features are still somewhat simplistic in their implementation compared to a full-blown 3D package, but it's definitely nice to have 3D, a, a full shading system in your 3D package, even though it's somewhat simplistic. Really what Nuke's 3D system is best for is applying textures to geometry in the more like the simple case that I showed where you attach the texture directly to the geometry and rendering that through rather than trying to do full shading like this. So now that I've said all that, let's look at the basics of adjusting the material. Right now you can see you can adjust the diffuse color yourself if you like. So I'm going to make him a little bit, let's say we'll make him kind of bluish. Turn up the blue in him. 
So this is his blue diffuse component. And you can also edit the his emission and specular. So right now he's quite shiny uh, or quite specular and also uh, pretty dull in his shininess. If you wanted to make him, or pretty shiny, I should say, if you wanted to make him more dull, you could do that here by adjusting his min and max shininess. And uh, reducing his specular, let's say. So he's mostly diffuse. Um, and if you wanted to make him be emissive, like in the case that you wanted to mix a little bit of this shading with the texture you were passing through, you can make him emissive, and you can make him emissive any color you want. So all of these, instead of being constant inputs, can also have maps attached to them. So if I wanted to make his specular color the color of the texture that we attached, I could attach that texture to, this is the diffuse. And this multiplies with the color that is in that slot. So if you're not careful, you can essentially override the color in his material by adjusting it here. So this becomes, in this case, becomes a slider for the, if you just left it solid like this and adjusted it down, this would become a multiplier on the input that you attach to the input. This input here is the emission. So if you wanted to use it similar to how if you connected it directly to this, you could do that by connecting it to this input instead. And it will still mix in the diffuse component. And that's one of the things about working in 3D you've got to be respectful of. This is a full shading model now that's attached to this. So if you didn't want any diffuse component, you'd want to turn that all the way down. And if you didn't want any specular component, you'd have to turn that all the way down here. And now it's basically just coming through this emission channel or through this constant channel. Okay, so let's put this back on the diffuse and make sure that there is some diffuse. And we've got a shaded guy. So we can see we have a 3D rendered guy with shadows being cast, but uh, right now the anti-aliasing quality is very low. This is something to be aware of in the scanline render. Uh, if you want anti-aliasing, you need to turn it on here. This will do a bit of oversampling to increase the anti-aliasing. And you can also use multi-sample. When you have motion, you can use multi-sample and that will uh, and increase the sample diameter a little bit and that will increase the, the size of the samples, this really only works with multi-sample, but uh, once you've done that, and especially if you have motion, you'll get uh, slightly improved uh, anti-aliasing overall. But as you can see, the render time gets uh, substantially slower, and this is, this is my biggest gripe with Nuke's 3D system. It's, uh, it's very flexible and the, uh, very rationally thought out, but the renderer itself is incredibly slow and uh, and so in, in that respect it's not uh, really ideal for a lot of different situations any situation where you have heavy amounts of geometry or anything it's really uh, more for when you need to use 3d geometry to move textures around there we go one static render scan line rendered with Shadow map shadows, and as you can see, it took a little a little while to render there.